All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say hello to everyone out there in the audience. Thank you for joining uh, me today for this conversation uh, about hybrid work and taking a people first approach. I'm going to go ahead and share my deck now. There we go. And then also bring you all back. So I can see the chat as we go along here. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Karawana Gatimu. I work in Microsoft Teams Engineering. I run our customer advocacy group and I'm happy to be with you here today at Teams Nation. Uh, Teams Nation is a fantastic event led by amazing and dedicated community leaders. Uh, as a long-term member of the Microsoft community, I'm always thrilled to see these sorts of events. I feel like they're the lifeblood of learning in our ecosystem, which can be quite daunting. So I'm happy to be here uh, representing Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365. If you have ever seen uh, one of my presentations, you'll know that I always lead with resources first. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you are clear on the fact that you can uh, follow information about Microsoft 365, about adoption and change management, our people first strategy, and all of the tools that we deliver to help you with that uh, on our uh, reasonably new Microsoft adoption Twitter handle. That is our official handle. You're welcome to follow me as well. If you follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, you may get the uh, occasional picture of my dogs and some of my personal opinions. If you just want the facts only, then go ahead and follow Microsoft Adoption and you will stay up to date on everything that's happening in the ecosystem. We also publish a newsletter on uh, adoption news on LinkedIn. And of course, there is our adoption community. We have a Microsoft Teams community. There's communities out there on the Microsoft tech community for all of our products. And we have one specific to driving adoption as well that talks about the people centric issues that we are all facing <laughs> as we continue to evolve uh, with hybrid work uh, as we go forward. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact, as you can see also from my background, that it was the anniversary, the fifth anniversary of Microsoft Teams on March 14th. I can hardly believe it's been five years, a little bit more for me uh, being, uh, you know, working on this product. and. I'm very humble and grateful for the, the many, many people who not only use the product, but also help us take it to new heights with your feedback. Your feedback is central to the way that we do product management inside Microsoft, uh, and you can continue to celebrate this with the custom backgrounds that we created specifically for the community, like the one that you see here, um, and they're available to you now. Or you can also submit your own to our custom background gallery. So. Hope that you're able to do those things. And again, really, this anniversary is about thanking all of you um, for your use of our product and for the feedback that you give us uh, in the community. So very excited to have this be, um, you know, a part of what's happening um, at Teams Nation as well this month. I want to switch topics now, and before I, I go into some of my um, additional slides, please feel free to put all your questions in the chat. Um, I will do my level best to uh, answer them as I go along, but also as we talk about the actual features themselves, happy to answer questions on that. Um, but first, we're going we're gonna to change our view a little bit. A lot of these keynotes you'll hear us at Microsoft talk a lot about features. Features are very important. Obviously, we're a technology company and that is what we do. We deliver products, services, and features. Um, but I'd like to talk about something a little bit different. We really need to take a look at the way that we're approaching our technology deployments, um, especially in this uh, world that has been so deeply impacted by the pandemic. Um, and this was something that was being thought about and discussed, uh, you know, at Microsoft for some time. Um, in my team in particular, we codified this as the people first strategy. And that's for technology professionals, business leaders, even individuals, really putting people at the center of the, of the decisions that we make. Those people may be various personas. They may be your customers, your employees, your business partners, but really thinking about and understanding the needs of the people around you lead us to make better decisions when implementing technology in particular. So we have to update the strategies that we have. We're responding to business and cultural challenges that as we can see in the world today, continue to impact our world. 
And um, these can be large and small, but they impact different people in different ways, depending upon the region you may be in or the role that you have. So the strategies that we have for our businesses and for the technology we use have to reflect the times that we're living in. Now, it would be easy to put technology as the second pillar of this people first strategy, but that's not what it is. What is really key is the feedback that you get from customers, partners, and employees. That is the secret sauce of how you could succeed in your organization, whether you're trying to drive adoption of Microsoft Teams and hybrid work, or you're trying to transform your own product set. Making sure that you have appropriate listening systems in place to get feedback from those customers, employees, and partners. Um, can help you to then prioritize the work and the opportunities that face your organization, right? There's more work than anybody will ever get done. Let's just all accept that. Uh, it's something that I deal with every day. I know all of you deal with it every day. And the question is, how do we prioritize that work? I talked a little bit about that on a video on my show, Coffee in the Cloud, recently, but it's worth reiterating here that that feedback will allow you to prioritize the opportunities, the features, and the services that you have at your fingertips uh, so that you can enable those business scenarios uh, that will drive the appropriate outcomes for your company or for your group. Now, maybe you're saying, I'm not you know, a C-level leader in my organization, uh, you know, I'm just me, but you can embody this as well. And from a professional standpoint, this strategy will allow you to differentiate yourself from other people in your organization or in the business uh, who, so that you can continue to craft a forward movement in your own career. I am the poster child for taking uh, this kind of approach uh, of being a member of the community and having the community help me build my career. Uh, but also differentiating myself from other people who look at technology as a set of features. I look at technology as a set of brushes that allow me to paint an, an outcome uh, for a set of stakeholders uh, based on the changing conditions that I may find myself in. And that uh, business solution architecture mentality um, has allowed me to create a, a, a very good career for myself. And you can too. Uh, you wouldn't be here at Teams Nation if you didn't want to improve uh, and learn. And so uh, taking this from the organizational level, but also to the personal level for career development uh, is an opportunity that we all have right now that we can lean into. It's very important to understand that people are the great differentiator in the organization. It's not the product, it's not the service, it's not the new whiz bang feature that you have just spent uh, six weeks coding. Um, it is actually the people in the organization which will be the competitive differentiation for your company. So our investment in the people uh, is absolutely key. The talent that we bring into the organization, that we retain, that we develop, uh, is what is going to have a dramatic impact on the success of whatever initiative you may be uh, you know, uh, focused on. If this is you as an individual, you are that talent. Uh, and investing in yourself and in your peers uh, and in the future that you have in this business is extremely important to the well-being of your family. You'll hear me as a Microsoft person now talking more about this uh, you know, career development path because hybrid work is also about work-life balance. And for me, work-life balance is about meaning in the work that I do, uh, feeling valued, working for an organization that I believe in, and also feeling as if my contributions are appropriately rewarded. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a volunteer at Microsoft, even though I have volunteered a lot in the Microsoft ecosystem, uh, I am an employee. And so I have a career that it is up to me to manage. And so, you know, making sure that you're thinking that through um, as you design the uh, technology strategies with all the features that I'm going to speak about uh, is where you can get new grounding uh, in our approach to hybrid work as we go forward. Um, there's, there's some other information that also came out during the week of the team's anniversary, and it's called the Work Trends Index Report. And, and this is the, the stat that really struck me. 62% of frontline workers say that their leadership does not prioritize building culture. You know, you've, you've heard it, I'm sure, before, you know, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. And 
and this is more important now than ever, um, you know, with the great change going on, uh, people making new evaluations about their careers and their lives and what have you. If you are leading an organization or even a small team that doesn't pay attention to its culture, uh, you will not be investing in those people appropriately. That is not a people first strategy. And what you will find yourself dealing with is an exodus of talent. Many organizations are dealing with that today. Um, you know, the 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 respect that these especially frontline workers deserve uh, and the enablement that they need to do their jobs well is on us as technology professionals to deliver. And it's also on us to help our leaders understand the importance that technology can play in binding people together. Microsoft Teams is many things, but for me, it is a way of connecting. Like I'm connecting with all of you right now. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible, you know, uh, many years ago, or even much more difficult. Uh, I would have required a lot different equipment than what I have, you know, on this laptop in my house here today. And so it's very important uh, to understand that technology plays a role in the culture that you're driving in your organization. Um, and those frontline workers are excited. You know, so you have passion and excitement in staff that isn't being captured in your organization. That is fuel for transformation left on the table. Um, and I wanted to bring this to a, a little bit more of a personal note because with the great change and with the, the shifts that we're seeing because of hybrid work in the workforce itself, you know, it's important for us as employees and also as leaders to set appropriate expectations. So I'll tell you the story that, you know, I've gone through this myself right now. So uh, because of the of hybrid work and the flexible work policies that Microsoft has, I recently sold the main home that I had outside of Seattle. Um, I'm coming to you today from a place a little further south in Washington state. Um, it's a cabin that we have. I can see beautiful trees out the window, much more sustainable, a uh, little, little smaller location and also got a second location in Arizona that is warm. And so we did that for the health of my family, my husband in particular. So what I've done is I had to review my personal priorities. I love what I do at Microsoft, but there were improvements I could make in my personal life. Uh, and so I've invested in those changes. So know the why. Why do you want to make changes uh, as applicable to you for hybrid work? Why might your team want to? It's important for us as leaders to um, respond you know, empathetically to our team members when they come to us and say, hey, we're going, I'm going to make this change. It's also important to set individual expectations, right? You know, some people are changing jobs and finding out that the culture they've gone to is actually not as good uh, as the one that they left. Um, does your organization have clearly stated hybrid work policies? Um, what are the uh, flexible work policies that you have? What are the requirements? Uh, it's very important for people to know exactly what they're getting into and what, what is available to them as they make these decisions once they've identified their why. But unlike the beginning of the pandemic, we can take action in phases. Uh, you know, if, if your life was anything like mine, you know, in the course of three days, I came home from work for two years. Um, I came home from our facility for two years and I was very, very attached to working in the Microsoft campus amongst all of the amazing people in Microsoft Teams. I, I often describe it as feeling like I worked in the heart of a sun. It was so creative and there was so much energy. And then all of a sudden I was home. Um, and so that was not up to me how that change took place. But this one, the embracing hybrid work and the changes that we make is. And so as you think about this for yourself, for your teams, for your organizations, you know, break the changes into phases. Um, also, there are things to think about like capital improvements for, for uh, facilities in terms of new types of meeting devices that are necessary, new types of furniture. So everything doesn't have to be done at once. But I do want to give you a little bit of inspiration uh, about how, um, you know, some of us are approaching hybrid work. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to share a quick video with you. Um, so that you can uh, see exactly what some folks are doing uh, with a hybrid work now. Let me reshare real quickly. Make sure you can see this. And the link to this video is available um, if there are any uh, technical difficulties with it, but I really want you to have this opportunity um, to, to see some of the things that are occurring out there.
teams to help all of our employees understand and learn about how important the customer experience is in the store and how to deliver that. We've been able to leverage technology to stay close with each other through some of the most trying times in the retail industry. And I truly believe we're coming out of it stronger because we did it together. We help companies to use less carbon in their day-to-day -day business. We did an integration call center solution in Teams. These call centers just forward the call to the Teams phone number. We save around quarter of a million francs per year. That's a very clear saving. Virtual outfitting was born out of need. Stores shut down, people still want to go outside and get their gear, and so we made ourselves available via Teams. So we're going to measure your feet today. What we're trying to achieve is this inclusive environment. So if you're still working from home and you have people that are in office, that's a seamless conversation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Thanks for having us. Welcome to Principles of Advertising. It is great to see you all today in person and online. With the whiteboard, I can readily write on the board as if I was in a classroom. It's DNA polymerase. Teams makes us better in the classroom. It makes us better in the conference room. It makes us better as an organization because it provides access to everything that we are doing. So that's a little bit about how some people are handling this approach. And I see Tanya has got a great question out there and I'm gonna address you know, some of these best practices about hybrid work uh, because it's quite true. Not every room is going to have uh, Teams rooms or large scale devices, right? Many hybrid meetings will be conducted uh, in, some, in a similar fashion to what we're doing right now. Right? We're in a distributed space, everyone is in a different location, and how do we do this better? So um, we're going to talk about exactly that and also some more work trends index information and feature features that are coming to help you understand that. The number one thing I want to land with all of you is hybrid work only works when it is truly inclusive. Inclusivity is not a feature set, it's human behavior. And so uh, adopting best practices or recommended practices like making sure to ask people to contribute who may not have spoken up yet or share something in the chat, uh, making sure that there's time on camera and off camera in your meetings, providing pre-read materials. And there's a variety of ways that you can be inclusive in hybrid meetings that allow for different people's learning styles, whether they're extroverts or introverts, and the way that they assimilate information. Inclusivity, again, is a human behavior, uh, and we'll continue to talk more about that going forward. Th that inclusivity is part of that people first strategy. What do people actually need from this meeting? Does there need to be a meeting or could we have a chat in a channel instead? Uh, what, what are the best practices in your organization for synchronous and asynchronous collaboration? You know, this is about outcomes that we drive together. And then lastly, you know, it's really important that sometimes we have some fun. Um, I've been so impressed by um, my colleagues who are actually better, way better at this than I am, who have done a variety of different types of morale events virtually uh, over the course of the pandemic, from bingo to different sorts of games, uh, to online cooking shows uh, and competitions, scavenger hunts. You know, I don't think that we put enough emphasis on fun and team building in unique ways. Um, of course, we've all had, you know, happy hours online, but there's so much more that we can do to share with each other. Again, recognizing that not everyone wants to do the same thing at the same time. So as we go forward and think about the features that we're using, you know, keeping these three things, inclusivity, a people first approach, and bringing a little bit of fun and humanity to uh, the work that we're doing is key. Um, you know, that people first approach needs to address the needs of the employee. So uh, this is again from the Work Trends Index report and really making sure that we're, we're answering the, the why, what's in it for them. 
if you want your employees to return to the office uh, into the physical room rather than just saying yes you must do that what's in it for people to come back to the office because now we all realize that that is a an extra set of activities that we haven't had to do so making it really clear about what's in it for your employees to return to the workplace uh, and to be willing to change their identity with regard to work uh, is important. The next thought also is this, and I, I love these statistics, right? So 252% increase in time spent in meetings, but only 32% increase in chats. I would assert that there are many meetings that we could handle asynchronously uh, if folks would lean in to the channel structure in Microsoft Teams. I know we all use it for chat. There's lots of one-on-one -on -one chat going on and group chat, but the channel conversation is the place where you drive teamwork and collaboration and transparency. Uh, it reduces the difficulties of doing things like external sharing or who is going to see the history of a project when they're new on it. Um, I'm a huge proponent of larger teams with more members and more channels and with the advent of private channels and soon shared channels, uh, we will reduce the need for multiple teams for a similar project because of sensitive information. So I encourage you all to think about this synchronous versus asynchronous method of collaborating. And the same is true in Microsoft Office. When you think of leaving comments in a document, uh, in, in the type of co-authoring that can be done, which uh, we use quite frequently uh, because we're collaborating on documents in a variety of time zones, so it's not just about Microsoft Teams, it's about all of Microsoft 365 and how it can support that asynchronous collaboration in ways uh, that also make it uh, more useful for people to join when the time is right for them, right? It's so that they have that flexibility because it's about sustainability. Um, you know, I think we've all at one point or another uh, hit the virtual meeting burnout button. <laughs> Maybe I'll just speak for myself. I have hit the virtual meeting burnout button multiple times over the last couple of years. Uh, and so these are some examples of recommended practices that can reduce that uh, fatigue that literally happens in your brain when you are uh, you know, interacting with your computer. And especially if you're on camera in every meeting, uh, that definitely creates a good deal of fatigue, which is unequally bore by, by people in the ecosystem. Uh, and so you know, how can you divide and conquer across team meetings? Uh, can you, uh, again, uh, cover this in an email or in chat, uh, in a channel chat conversation instead, using uh, either manual methods in Outlook or using a Microsoft Viva to make sure that you have focus time? I was in an internal event recently in Microsoft, uh, and it was a product management uh, a conference, uh, you know, all of us are product managers. And so, you know, bringing together uh, industry leaders to, to help us learn about that. And there was a, an industry leader from Adobe who talked about the fact that before the pandemic, we were in an age where we were talking about productivity, but now we need to be thinking about creativity. And I loved that because this is why focus time is so important. I'm likely not going to be at my best creatively in the five minutes or the 10 minutes in between my meetings. I need a sustained time to be able to creatively think about the business challenges that are in front of me and my team, uh, or my team and I. And so it's really important to, to be able to have that focus time, uh, to be able to think creatively and approach the problems uh, and challenges that we're all facing. Um, and, and also, you know, there's more about this in terms of, you know, there's some some vice presidents inside Microsoft that if you don't put an agenda in your meeting, they're not coming. <laughs> so, you know, I, I find myself often being the champion for these, these recommended practices inside of Microsoft. And it's how we start to make these behaviors normal. When some of us individuals uh, take on the mantle of being that architect of change and gently reminding people, hey, you know, in our organization, we always start meetings five minutes after the hour to give people time for, for stretching and standing. Uh, or um, could you please, you know, add an agenda to that meeting so that everybody has clarity on what we're trying to achieve? You know, we don't have to be, you know, uh, intense about it, but those gentle, consistent reminders uh, will help people change their behaviors uh, so that we create a new hybrid work culture uh, throughout our organizations that is sustainable and really embraces the need humans have for focus, connection, and time away. 
We can also look at the hard data in terms of the percentage of meetings and how those meetings are changing, how the times have changed over time. Uh, and, you know, 2 to 3 p.m., for instance, rising in popularity, not so much on my team because that's not super inclusive of Eastern and, and European time zones. Um, certainly, you know, I can look at my calendar and see that the 7 to 10 a.m. time uh, is, you know, hotly uh, at requested uh, because it will help people, you know, from around the world. Um, so if you're dealing with multiple time zones, this data may look different. Um, but think about how your day has changed. Uh, and the time zones uh, and the time slots that you are uh, dealing with, um, because that can also help you make those personal adjustments. I do some of my best thinking uh, between 3 and 7 p.m. Uh, that is just when my brain is most uh, awake. Uh, I'll show up to your 6 a.m. meeting, but you won't get the full care on it. <laughs> so know from a personal productivity standpoint, you know, what is best for you and your team, especially if you're leading team. You can learn more about this and the research that's behind these statements uh, by visiting the Work Lab site. It is a fantastic resource. I love their podcast, which I listen to while I'm on my walks because I can kind of creatively take in the information. And these are the larger strategies and research that will help you now think about the tactical elements of the features we're delivering and how to implement them appropriately. Uh, and of course, the index report itself uh, you know, synthesizes those things in the various trends uh, that we're going to be dealing with uh, over the coming years. So now let's switch. Let's switch topics for a second. First, let me go and take a look in the chat here and see. Um, let's see. Okay, great. Yes, we will share all of the links uh, to the Work Labs uh, content um in the uh in the chat and of course you'll have the access to this um uh, deck after the fact as well uh so we'll make sure to share that for you now i'm going to start talking about some features and there's a variety of features that are going to become available to you uh, over time everything that i'm sharing today either is on its way to roll out or will be rolling out uh, soon before the end of what is our fiscal year end of june and again, this now provides you with a menu of options that you can apply in the appropriate situations based on the people you are trying to serve. The feature set that I recommend to executives in Microsoft is often a little bit different than the feature set I re recommend to the individual worker, or we call individual contributor. Uh, and so it's important to take features in the context of the needs of the individual. Pinning or hiding your own video in Teams meetings is one of my favorite things because, as I mentioned, I'm in a lot of meetings. I'm on video a lot. I don't need to look at myself all day long. <laughs> I do not find that enjoyable. Once I make sure that my setup looks okay, I can uh, either pin my video or hide it depending upon how I feel in that day. It's worth mentioning also that it's quite useful to uh, establish meetings that are no camera meetings. Uh, I try to do that in some of my staff meetings, every other one. So we establish connection, be able to visually see each other, but we also respect the fact that not everybody likes to be on camera by having that camera turned off uh, as a part of the culture of some of our meetings. So this is giving each individual more flexibility around that. Another uh, area that I you know, deem as a people first um, you know, feature uh, is the local time added to the people profile. Um, this is extremely relevant for organizations that have customers around the world, um, the partners they brought into their tenant or a company like Microsoft where we have a global footprint. It's important for me to be able to understand what time is it before I go message that person. Um, you know, there is a lovely workflow that is coming that allows you to delay send on chat. Uh, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, I've been testing that inside of Microsoft uh, and then more features around that. So delayed send and outlook for email and delayed send for chat will allow you to land those messages during somebody's working hours and have uh, you know, insight into what those working hours actually are. Um, it's not all about Teams, right? Microsoft 365 has a variety of services that are available uh, in this area. And Yammer is the place where communities live. Enterprise communities are best served in Yammer, especially when you're in an organization that has more people uh, than you can have in an individual team. And Yammer is also built for things like upvoting and announcements. Uh, search is a little bit different. So 
you know, I encourage you to not think of everything just in Microsoft Teams. Teams is where you get work done and you can bring in other aspects of Microsoft 365 or the Microsoft Cloud into Microsoft Teams, as well as communities. If you haven't checked out the communities app uh, inside of, uh, you know, Teams, uh, which is Yammer, then I encourage you to do that. But this upvoting is a wonderful thing, especially if you're running a community that is supporting the different experiences that you're delivering inside your organization. We also have new meeting RSVP options, which we're happy about. Um, these uh, virtual options uh, will be available in public preview soon. And, you know, uh, it, it's important uh, to be able to know whether you're planning on joining a meeting in person or virtually. That helps your meeting organizer plan. There's nothing worse than having a huge room ready for 20 people when, in fact, only, you know, five are going to attend in person and everybody else is going to be virtual. It also changes the way you might organize the meeting or deliver the content. And so uh, having these updated RSVP options we think will be helpful and that having everyone have the right information uh, for dealing with hybrid meetings. Uh, and again, uh, you know, being able to continue to alter the way that you um, share your own image uh, in a particular presentation uh, helps that content be engaging. And so uh, we're continuing to make investments in the uh, work that we're doing in PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint Live is, of course, available, and now our recording studio and this ability to put yourself into the PowerPoint presentation as a cameo and adjust that. It's just the beginning of the new types of layouts that we're going to give people uh, for their content. Um, you know, it's, it's important to start to use those things and practice with them. Practice with them in just a team's meeting uh, that you're having with maybe your own individual team before you do it on a large stage. Um, shared channels. I know you've been waiting. I know you've been waiting. I get so many questions about shared channels on a regular basis. Shared channels are going to be a wonderful addition to our ability to bring people together in those single larger teams. Again, that is our recommendation. Rather than having a bunch of little teams, have larger teams around either customer engagement or broader sets of projects. Uh, it also serves to invest in talent in your organization. Those people can cross train across different types of work uh, that helps it be a creative and engaging workplace. Uh, so these shared channels are going to be an important component of that. Um, they will be coming soon into preview. We do not have a general availability date at this time because we really want to make sure that we're monitoring for performance and other things, uh, you know, any bugs that we may encounter, etc. Uh, before we do the rest of the global rollout. So. We welcome your feedback. We know you've been waiting. Thank you for being patient. Uh, and we're excited to see what's next uh, with shared channels. And then, you know, remember I said we wanted to have fun. We do. And fluent emojis are a fun way of doing that. We also have a new wave emoji that came out uh, to celebrate the anniversary, which you can see on our team's blog. Um, but what I also love about uh, fluent emojis is the ability to select uh, skin tone for the appropriate emojis. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm a mixed race descendant and I like to pick the appropriate color for my thumbs up, as many people do. Um, and uh, you'll see more of those things coming across Microsoft 365. Pronouns, uh, being able to pick those skin tones and more personalization options across Microsoft 365 from the people perspective, uh, you'll see continue uh, to make themselves available uh, in uh, Microsoft Teams and beyond. Microsoft Teams really is that that app, that, that heartbeat of Microsoft 365. And so whether it's this feature or any other, you know, it's all in service of what you're trying to get done. Uh, you know, using first and third party apps, making sure you have tabs, bringing people into the channel conversation, um, CCing the channel conversation on emails that you send so that it's in both places. You know, these are the types of recommended practices that you'll see us continue to update on adoption.microsoft.com, on Microsoft Learn, uh, as we expand our training options there uh, and more. So, you know, we're excited about everything that we bring to you um, because we're really embracing this relentless pursuit of improvement. Gone are the days like at the beginning of my career where there was a version of software and it was shrink wrapped and I had three years to uh, master it, deploy it, master it and, you know, come up with upgrade options and, and what have you. You know, 
Microsoft 365 and Microsoft in general releases new features almost every week. And, you know, that pace of change has had a dramatic impact on the way that we uh, come up with strategies, on the way that we conduct our work. I encourage you to find an area that you like teams or others that you want to really go deep in, but don't forget to look left and right. You know, um, we're working on that inside Microsoft as well, but, but keep an eye on the rest of the ecosystem, like what's happening in Power Platform with Power Apps and Power Automate. Uh, what's happening in industry cloud, you know, what's happening in, in terms of development, mobile apps and adaptive cards. All of these things make you a more valuable professional and allow you to have more, uh, you know, tools in your toolkit to create an engaging and truly collaborative uh, experience for users around the world. At the end of the day, however, it's our ability to work together. Collaboration is a human activity. And it is the respect that we have for one another, the creativity that comes out of this community um, that we thrive on at Microsoft. And maybe now more than ever, this ability to respect differing opinions and come together for a common cause is so important. And you know, it's something that I really believe in and my colleagues do at Microsoft as well. And we like to step forward with that in our products and in the way that we engage with all of you. So it's always a privilege uh, to be with you. And I see we have some questions in the chat. So I am going to go and take a look at some of those questions and see what answers I can provide all of you. You see, I need glasses for that part. <laughs> uh, how about a way to dictate how to pronounce your name? As a matter of fact, uh, pronunciation recordings are something we're testing inside of Microsoft. Hope to have that uh, come out soon. Uh, certainly someone like myself, Caruana, could use that attached to my profile card, uh, and we will certainly be doing that. Um, pronouns on the people card, another item that we are testing inside of Microsoft. Um, and of course, administrators will be able to, you know, control that. Uh, people don't have to fill it in. It's not a mandatory thing. Uh, it's an option uh, that um, end users can embrace should they choose to. Um, and yes, the local time zone will come from someone's profile. Um, I do believe that you can also set it as a user and it will also um, read it from your computer and maybe one of my colleagues on the line will keep me honest on that. I can double check that. But um, first and foremost, it's going to come from your AAD profile. And then I believe you as an end user will be able to update that. Say I'm traveling and I'm in you know, Europe this week, I would be able to change that on my profile, even though I don't usually change the time of my actual computer when I travel so that I can keep some you know, connection to uh, my home a time zone. Delayed send, very important. Thank you uh, for posting the Work Lab podcast link and the Work Lab link. That's excellent. Um, and yes, I highly recommend including agendas and just getting uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, it's worth also mentioning that we didn't talk about it today, but I will be discussing it very soon, and that's Microsoft Loop. And Loop is a fantastic way to create uh, portable collaboration experiences um, for those kind of quick interactions uh, and tracking agendas, allowing co-authoring. And then when they become formal, then they turn into documents, spreadsheets and SharePoint pages and actual Word documents. Uh, but I love embedding Loop in chat and you're going to see more from Microsoft Loop in Teams. Uh, and we're have, you know hotly creating some of the recommended practice guidance that you'll see in adoption at Microsoft.com uh, between now and June and more will come. But think about Microsoft Loop and how it can help you with things like those quick agendas or tasks lists. Uh, that you're creating, uh, you know, as you're collaborating with other people. Uh, yes, and you're you're so right, Carolyn. People introduce themselves and say their names way too quickly. I am guilty of that. Uh, Caruana Gatimu Goggin is my full name. I catch my maiden name is my middle name. I do say it uh, too quickly quite often, um, but I also really only expect people to get Caruana. If you get that, that's that's good enough. <laughs> There's only one at Microsoft. And so <laughs> if you uh, put that in your favorite search engine, you will find me um, and and uh, and all the the good colleagues that I work with. I am going to um, quickly also switch back to this slide and leave this one up as I'm doing the Q&A. Um, do make sure that you follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn and in the actual community itself. Um, there's so much stuff that's happening 
on a regular basis um, that we try to consolidate that across Microsoft 365 in these three channels so that you can stay up to date in one place. Um, we always appreciate more people also at our monthly community calls in the driving adoption community. Many of the slides that I use today were actually from that community call yesterday. We do this Microsoft 365 briefing every month. It's free and open to everyone. Um, and events like Teams Nation uh, help us to, uh, you know, get that information out there around the world. So we appreciate the community organizers as well. Any other particular questions you want to put out there in chat, I am happy to answer or uh, things that you think are aren't working about hybrid work. Love to get some feedback from you on that. Um, Windows Surface. Um, oh, I want I do want to go back to Tanya's original question um, about hybrid work and meetings. So. You know, it's important to understand the setup of conference rooms in your corporate facilities, but it's also for me actually more important to understand who's there in the room and who isn't. Um, I've definitely had to increase my meeting facilitator skills uh, over time and in this virtual world, I think that's going to go through another phase um, as we go back to hybrid. Um, I left actually a workshop with about 20 people in it to come and give this keynote. And I was really impressed by the way that the facilitator was handling, um, you know, making sure that we all had an opportunity to give our feedback on the document that they shared. So they shared a document that was a position paper. We had five minutes in the meeting uh, to actually just read the document. So we were all quiet, uh, put comments in the Word document, and then she opened it up for discussion. And we used the hand raise feature to give our feedback and give insight to the comments we put in that document. That's just one way of facilitating a larger hybrid meeting, but it was very effective when you have a larger audience uh, to make sure that everyone gets to be heard. I love the hand raise feature. <laughs> Sometimes I need to remember, you know, I love the fact that now I can go to the people tab and see the order in which people have raised their hands so I can call on people in order. Uh, you know, that those are the kinds of things uh, if you're a meeting facilitator, being really familiar with the team's client is your friend knowing different ways people can share content, using the whiteboard app, using hand raise, even using breakout rooms, uh, which I use for my own office hours with my team. Um, all of these things you can find on our meetings microsite and more is coming as these new features come out. Um, but we're writing that in the case of scenarios, like the type of meeting you might want to do. So I did want to uh, kind of touch on that a little bit more. Um, and let's see, um, having an explicit online moderator when you have a meeting with many people. Yes, that is another recommended practice. If your meeting has more than seven or eight people, uh, having somebody who is the moderator and having another person who's taking notes or simply using the recording and the transcript to generate your notes after the fact uh, is a very useful thing. Often I record meetings not because I'm going to go back and listen to the recording or even share it, uh, but because of the transcript feature that allows me then to capture uh, good information and, and tasks and action items. Uh, and so transcript is your friend. Uh, but definitely identifying those roles in a larger meeting is useful. Um, it's worth calling out now that managed meetings that have co-organizer roles where you can control much like this, who can come off and on mute, who can share their camera, uh, also improves the experience for people, you know, as they are um, experiencing your content um, and engaging with you. Uh, let's see. Um, Adoption isn't going, so Anya says, adoption isn't going well right now for teams. Um, and you're nervous about the rollout, right? Um, and you know something, um, Ayana, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, I'm with you. I felt the same way when we rolled out Teams at Microsoft, which was my project. It is very nerve wracking. Um, and here's my three tips for successful rollout. Make sure you have a group of early adopters who understand teams for the various departments that you're rolling it out to. Uh, make sure that those folks are brought into a community where they can ask questions uh, and get answers. Uh, if you don't have Microsoft staff helping you, though Fast Track certainly will for free, depending on the size of your organization, 
or if you don't have a, you know, an MVP or a Microsoft partner, join our champions community. We have a champions management platform. We have defined rollout plans. You can use Teams Advisor to give you the checklist of the activities that you need to do. Um, and, and show that you have that end to end plan to the stakeholders in your organization. But here is the real secret sauce. Why do people need teams? What are they doing now? What's in it for your end users? If people don't understand what they're going to get from using this new technology, they will ignore your new technology. It could be teams, it could be anything. So it's very important that you speak in their language to them, not about features, but about outcomes. This is gonna make it easier for you to share a photo from the field. This is gonna make it easier for you to put in your request for time off. Build in some of these experiences so they don't come to what we call the Teams ghost town, right? Many people, when they first rolled out Teams, especially in the rapid deployments, they didn't have any Teams built. And the teams that they had built were a general channel and no content. That is not an engaging experience. And so you need to have a landing zone for the people who are onboarding. Maybe you're doing them in batches, department by department, or maybe you're doing them all at once, depending on the size of your company. But making sure that there is a landing experience. Um, using something like Microsoft 365 Learning Pathways and our Getting Started app will allow you to control that experience. So there's lots of resources. That was a crash course in Teams adoption and deployment. Um, happy to give you more information on that um, out in our driving adoption community. So if you wanna ask that question out there, also, Forget what I say from Microsoft. In the driving adoption community, people who have actually done this work, other customers will help you. Um, that's what I love about this community is that everyone is so very helpful. They have real world information. I try to stay very close to the real world, but I do work inside Microsoft and sometimes that's a little bit of a layer away. Um, and so the best thing you can do is learn from others, but you know, take it in phases. Don't overwhelm yourself, do one thing at a time, and remember to serve the end user and you'll be just fine. Teams will do well for you. All right, um, yes, ghost towns are bad. <laughs> ghost towns are bad at a variety of levels, but they're certainly bad in teams. People are like, well, why am I here? Right, and so you have to have people who will have conversations, share information, share news articles, you know, something that end users actually care, uh, you know, uh, care about. Uh, because otherwise they just won't pay attention. Um, thank you. I did say meeting microsite. That is on adoption.microsoft.com and I will uh, put that into the chat or share that after the fact. Uh, our meeting microsite uh, goes through some updates about every other month. We're about due to publish another one. And so that is uh, what we have out there. Uh, but adoption.microsoft.com, if you haven't visited it, I highly recommend it. Um, of course, I recommend it because it's my team's experience. But I also recommend it because as a customer of Microsoft, there used to be 16 or 17 different sites where I would go and get information about how to deploy, roll out, and drive adoption of the different Microsoft services. And I made it my mission in life after coming to Microsoft that there would be one. And that is adoption at Microsoft.com. So whether you're using lists, which I hope you're using, or Yammer or Teams, you can go out there and you can filter the information by your role, whether you're an IT professional, a champion, or a business user, a developer, or you can put, filter it by product. And there's a lot of resources that are available, like a training plan, uh, like uh, information about Teams Advisor, which, as I said, will create that team for you and, and, a, and, a, and a planner with all the activities for doing a Teams deployment. Um, so, you know, if you don't have a bookmarked, please do, please share it with others. Um, it is currently not localized, so I apologize. It is only in English, but we are working uh, hotly behind the scenes, hopefully to move it by uh, end of June uh, so that we will uh, be available in 10 different languages, all of the content there. So uh, we've heard your feedback on that and we're working to make that a reality soon. And yes, you know, being able to tell the story and answer chat at the same time is a skill that I have developed over time. <laughs> and so, you know, it's uh, it's something that you get used to. But I want to thank you again for including me in this conference. I love Teams Nation. Uh, definitely love all the work that you're doing here and very happy to be a part of it as always. Thank you so much.